because of those traits, that personality, which is this overarching guide for behavior, that is causal to political attitudes. Um, but there's a lot more literature that hasn't been seen in, in our current political science literature, and that's personality, is, uh, it, it's actually peaks much later than expected, so from around 50, that the traits are somewhat malleable, and they're particularly contextually malleable, so during certain environments we express certain type of personality traits. Um, and they covariate with a lot more of immediate constraints, much like attitudes. And on the other hand, political attitudes are actually much more stable than the early literature assumed. And formation begins really early. Um, uh, Turney and Perda's work, which isn't well read in political science, <coughs> did one of the largest studies on children, some 70,000, uh, and found that they actually had attitudes. Person took that study, uh, the study design, and started doing the same analysis with children pre-kindergarten and found that they actually, through symbols and pictures, depicted political position. We wouldn't call them political, but they had things to do with like sharing, leadership, organization, and so forth, which highly correlate with adults later in life. Um, and then I had a study that looked at teenagers, uh, well, 8 to 18. It was a panel study taking every one and a half years, and we started to see attitudes emerge, the same attitude structure, about 15 years of age. They, they mimic the structure of their parents, but not necessarily the attitude, so the sophistication interpretation came about the same. Now, this huge literature started to move in, and these are um, the two seminal pieces in the genetics of social attitudes. This is uh, Ease and Ising's paper in 1974 in Nature, and what's considered the seminal piece uh, is Proceedings of National Academy, as a piece by uh, Nick Martin, a Lynn Neves uh, student and uh, company. Um, and since then, there's been a lot of studies on the genetics of social attitudes, these are just a few of the papers, but we picked it up in mainstream political science. What this led to was a, a slight modification of the personality leads to attitudes. It led to this model where as genes lead to personality leads to attitudes. So it basically ignored the kind of direct effect of potential dispositional influences that could possibly have some causal mechanism to lead to attitudes. It just operates through personality. This is a paper that came out in the APSR. So it's really more of the same. It's the same model with just one slight modification. This is what's currently in, in the literature. Um, but we're not sure we believe this model, so we took like three steps to actually test this causal assumption. Is it really simply just attitudes really have no genetic influence whatsoever, and it's all operating through personality? Um, so one is to look at the covariance between attitudes and personality, and see if the, just the covariance is due at an environmental level, a familial level, or some type of familial genetic level. Um, to conduct a longitudinal design to see if changes in personality uh, track with changes in political attitudes, and then conduct a directional causation model to see if we actually, with uh, all three variance components of genes and environment, to see which one causes the other statistically. So um, we have quite a bit of data, about 60,000 family members across two continents, quite a bit of attitudes. Uh, we have two of the biggest measures in personality over the last several decades, the icing personality quotient and the big five. Um, we have some cross-sectional data from 1888, the two panel studies, um, which people were assessed 10 years apart, one they were assessed as teenagers, then again, sometime in their 20s and 30s, and then one where they were assessed some between 1965 and then again between 29 and 75. So it's quite a powerful and rich data set. Um, we use factor uh, scores, confirmatory factor models, um, estimated at the time of the analysis. Uh, so you basically put it into the model, it's estimated uh, at that time. We also did it estimating the scores and then using them together uh, again as separate traits. It didn't, there was no difference in the model. We use the um, Koleski decomposition in MX, since this is just genetic modeling. You guys have seen this earlier. I'm happy to explain this in a lot more detail if you like. And we also use an extended family model. And so we didn't just use twins. We used twins, parents, children of twins, spouses of twins, and the spouses of the, I guess, the parents, co-spouse, and then the siblings and any and non-twin siblings and any spouses they had. So every member of the family that we could assess, we put in the model. Um, when we talk about attitude dimensions, I might give you an idea when we're saying attitude dimensions or attitudes, we factor them into some meaningful constructs that we see in the literature. And so you can see we have like a military attitudes dimension, what we call social ideology, which you can call it what you, what you will. Um, fiscal ideology would seem to be some economic terms. And there were several other dimensions, but this is the general gist of when we're talking about attitude dimensions. When we look at the correlations between personality scales and attitude dimensions, if we're going to decompose the variance or use them in a meaningful way, we want to see pretty large correlations. If you see something about 0 0.2, 0 0.1, there's not a lot to decompose. When you're at the 0.3 range or, or larger, you can actually use it. Otherwise, you just basically leave it on the table. I mean, we 
we, we still do it sometimes if we really believe in the traits. Um, but in this case, we're quite lucky. So neuroticism, as in several other traits, has been found to correlate with economic ideology. So more neurotic, more liberal on, on economic scales. Um, the P scale is icing psychoticism scale, which is a blend of tough-mindedness, disagreeableness, if you will, um, and militarism to some degree, or aggression. And of course, that tracks with military attitudes and non-liberal social attitudes, as, as expected. Extroversion is extroversion, doesn't really track with anything, uh, as found in other studies. And we have a unique personality measure that's not well used in the literature on social desirability. What makes social desirability unique, it's very context specific. So it doesn't look like any other personality trait. Um, and so it's one of the reasons why it's not used very often. Uh, but it's one as political scientists we might quite like a bit because we're really interested in social desirability effects. So having a measure of social desirability is great. Um, so, and we see somewhat similarities between males and females, some slight differences in strength, but generally the same direction of the correlation is um, we talked a little bit about the twin design. We can get into the mathematical model, if you will. Um, probably do that in Q&A because we're probably running time. We talked a little bit about the Koleski, which is basically a bivariate version of the twin design. Um, we'll get into that in a little more detail. So our first study was actually to look at the correlations between these two constructs in both the gene and the environment model. And what we found was that uh, for, and this we did for lots of traits, I'm just showing the openness one, um, almost all the correlation was at the additive genetic level except for social desirability. That was actually the common and unique environmental level. So again, it's quite unique in just about every property. But every other trait, psychoticism, neuroticism, all the attitude factors, somewhere between 60 and 90% of the covariance was occurring through uh, uh, the additive genetic level. These are very large samples. We're talking 14 to 17,000 pairs of twins when you combine them. So um, highly statistically significant, replicates across cultures and time periods, uh, US and Australia. So we quite believe this paper was published, the first was published in Personality and Individual Difference uh, last year. Um, and to just look at, you know, instead of the path model, if you do look at percentages, um, this is a, a bit ugly, but um, look at the additive genetic variance here, so now the pointer's not working. But uh, over in that second column, so 0 0.68, 0 0.63, 0 0.61, 0 0.58, uh, then you look at social desirability and you see that's the one, that's the oddball. Most of the uh, covariance is occurring at this common environment level, so that makes it really unique. And common and social desirability is context specific, so we're seeing that operating both in itself and through its relationship with attitudes, which is pretty great. And then neuroticism, 0.6 something for additive genetics. So you're really seeing from almost all personality traits except social desirability, all the covariance is occurring at that level. Um, so this doesn't refute um, or um, privilege the kind of Mondad Gerber view of genes, personality, and behavior, but it says we really start, need to look at this now a little bit more. If it was all at the environmental level, we could, it would probably privilege their hypothesis, but that it's at the genetic level means this could be occurring either through attitudes or from some third latent trait that's influencing both mutually. Um, so instead of, uh, instead of causation, it could simply be correlation. That's what we look to test. So our next um, study was to actually extend this design out. Um, like I said, we used all family members. So this would be the model for twins. Once we add parents, we can get an estimate of vertical cultural transmission. So direct parenting. Does my parents' personality impart attitudes on, the, on, on siblings or children? We actually brought in the spouses of the twins and then the children of the twins and their spouses. So you can use every estimate under the sun. It's some 80-something mathematical equations after about the 45th equation of doing ID tracing rules. That's how I learned this path modeling. I know you can start laughing now. But you actually type, 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 type. Once I get to the 40-something, I basically pulled my hair out. I walked over to Matt Keller's office. I said, I cannot do this anymore. She's driving me nuts. About 15 minutes later, he came back and said, here's the rest. And I asked him, how did you do that? He said, oh, I just slammed it in a ramp path, and here it is. You can now just see if those are right. Go, you know, general rule of thumb, go to the mathematicians who know better. Um, so, uh, but we got roughly the same results using that large extended model as we did just the twin design. Um, and that tends to happen on so all traits we use on. That was a bivariate model, and so Brad was one of the first people to what we do. We're calling that model the Cascade. It used to be called the Stealth. Everybody likes to put their own little brand name on it. I don't really care. It's the extended kinship twin design. Um, he did it in a bivariate sense, got the same results that we had in the twin model. So we can actually have a lot of confidence in these both personality and attitude factors in smaller samples with only twins. So right off the bat, we have some questions now about this model, and it looks a little bit more like this model. <coughs> it looks like a common cosmos. 
um, because if, if you're sharing, if genetic variance is accounting for the relationship, there isn't a gene for personality. There isn't a gene for attitudes. Um, uh, it's polygenic and multifactorial. It means one gene, many traits. Um, you know, uh, the, it, it's, it just doesn't operate at a gene to trait basis. And so the idea that these genes for personality influence attitudes just doesn't seem to fit. Although it's possible, it's not plausible, but it's still possible. It's looking much more like this kind of model where it's a correlation. So then we did a longitudinal design. This is where we had the twins 10 years apart in two different studies. Um, and this is the ugliness of that structural model, time one, time two, but we'll kind of walk through it a little bit. So time one, uh, I think the two traits I put here was psychosis and social desirability, but psychosis and openness look just about the same. Um, and then we had religious attitudes and women's rights, because that's what we could replicate across studies and across time, and actually believe the traits this we reduced it to. And you can see this correlation between the personality traits, the correlation between the traits and the attitudes, and the correlation between the attitudes um, through these paths. When we add on time two, um, so this was the Australia in 1980-1990, you can see the strong relationship between the personality traits of time one, time two, fairly stable, but same with the attitudes. No real difference, right? So these, these traits look very much the same as far as stability goes. When we add in then the rest of the model and actually see what time two personality has on time two attitudes, we actually look at those last two cross paths, that's what's left when you're accounting for attitudes at time one. Basically, change in personality does not predict change in attitudes. And if it was a causal model between personality and attitudes, you would see it right here in longitude design. We don't see that. So that, that model, the personality causing attitudes, if you believe two large data sets longitudinal is out the door. No twin model here. This is just, we use the twins and we use the, we controlled for a number of people in the family, so we had two per family to come with these estimates. But this is a longitudinal design that anybody can do. I use a structural model. There you have it. So right there, now we're really struggling with this belief that personality causes attitudes. But let's go ahead and just hammer the nails in the coffin. Um, that was uh, personality. All right, direction of causation model. This is where it takes in all of the uh, variance for the three components and actually tests which model fits better to the data. Does the model fit better to the data where personality predicts attitudes? Where attitudes predicts personality through each latent factor, or where they mutually predict each other. We ran this this direction of causation model. We can talk about how it changes the mathematics um, uh, later. And what we found, and when you have a significant model, it means that um, uh, you, you basically can or can't drop it depending on the ordering of it. In this Koleski, we pretty much find um, <coughs> it's attitudes that's predicting personality. The, the genetic variance is operating through attitudes. Attitudes is then changing the environments or other that you select into to influence your personality for one or two of the dimensions. And then for the other two, uh, it makes no difference. This is mostly the model. So psychosis, openness, social desirability. If anything, it's attitudes predicting those traits. Mm -hmm. If anything. Most likely, like, we, some of them, the significance you could see was, was mm, getting close. And so all models mutual prediction or attitudes to personality fit better. Not a single model personality fit better to causing attitudes. Not in any case, not in any country, not in any relationship. Um, so our conclusion based on these three studies is personality traits do not cause attitudes. The cool thing about where the genes and environments come in is we wouldn't be able to see this design as clearly if only we use a longitudinal model. The longitudinal model would track change but we wouldn't be able to tell which variance component was actually tracking, like looking at the, the change in each of those latent factors of genes and environment could cause the other latent factors of genes and environment. We'd have to use some type of family model like we did here to get that third component. And so I think, you know, with those, that combination of three studies, it just pretty much ends the story. And I don't know if we could do that with only a panel study. We have to make, you know, each one of those models has its own specific set of assumptions. If you think about, you know, for a panel study, the assumption is that it's the change, but you could say, well, at time one, maybe all the action's happening at 16 years of age. In the genes and environment study, you could make the assumption that, well, it's quite complex when you're doing three latent traits, directional causation, you have to make sure that the three traits have different structures in order to find some causal track along the paths. There are some mathematical assumptions that you have to make, so you can argue against that. When you put all these stuff together, 
I think it's really tough to argue against that. Yeah, it's it's not causation; it's correlational. Um, two of those papers, I guess, one's forthcoming AJPS. One is uh, accepted or in print at uh, paid, and the third one, which is the longitudinal one, uh, that's in review now. So it'll be interesting to see how they respond, um, because it's actually quite a few people wedded to this design, really wedded to personality causing politics. Uh, so we're, we're we're kind of excited to see what they're going to come up with as a response. Um, uh, and yeah, so that's it. Thanks. Well, thank you very much.